Good afternoon. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Thought Leader series, The Future of Corrosion Protection. My name is Amanda and I'll be your host for today. Firstly, in keeping with our custom, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them, their cultures and to elders, past, present and emerging. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that today's webinar is being hosted with Engineers Australia's industry partner, Hempel. Founded in Denmark in 1915, Hempel is a global supplier of coatings and services in the protective, marine, decorative, container and yacht industries. Hempel factories, R&D centres and stock points are established in every region. A team of more than 6,500 people united in the belief that Hempel coatings can make its customers' business stronger and the world safer and longer lasting. Today, we will hear from two speakers, followed by a live audience Q&A, and I encourage you to send questions through to our speakers via the chat box. I'd now like to welcome our first speaker, Lauren Howe. Lauren is a senior materials engineer at Arup in Melbourne, having moved from Arup's London office in January 2020. Lauren has worked on a variety of condition assessments and failure investigations across buildings and infrastructure projects and uses this experience to support engineers and designers to specify durable materials and solutions. Lauren has also a particular focus on sustainability of materials, embodied carbon and the application of circular economy principles to reduce the envir environmental impacts of the built environment. Please welcome. Lauren Howe. Hi, my name is Lauren Howe and I'm a materials engineer at Arup in Melbourne. And so today my presentation is going to keep fairly high level before Hempel uh, give their presentation on their avant-garde product. And so I just want to set the scene and provide an overview of design for corrosion control, what the options are, uh, relevant standards and documents in the Australian context and some points you might want to consider. Uh, so feel free to put any questions in the chat throughout the presentation and I'll do my best to answer them later on. Um, so firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm presenting from today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So research from NACE International indicates that the effects of corrosion can contribute between three to 5% of global GDP. And so if we extrapolate this for Australia, this equates to up to $78 billion per year being spent on just remediating assets affected by corrosion. So this is mostly um, covers the oil and gas, uh, water and construction and infrastructure sectors. We all know some of the impacts corrosion can have, and this slide just summarizes a few uh, impacts, including um, safety and hazard risks, loss of performance or efficiency of equipment and operation, uh, reduced lifespan, impacts on appearance and aesthetics, um, and therefore perceived risks associated with that, and finally reputation, which all have an ongoing impact on cost. So we essentially have five main options for corrosion control, and I will be talking through each of them in the next slides. But the first thing is to do nothing. And this is when the corrosion does not actually present a risk to the structure or surrounding structures and aesthetics is not important, uh, an important consideration. The second is protective coatings, which Hempel will be speaking about one of theirs today. And this is, uh, typically the most typical solution. The third is providing corrosion allowance. So if we have a good understanding of the degradation that is going to occur in your specific exposure environment. The fourth is looking at corrosion resistant alloys such as stainless steel, copper, aluminium, depending on the application. And finally, uh, using techniques such as inhibitors or cathodic protection. So the do nothing option we can consider if the corrosion risk is negligible. So for example, if it's an internally controlled space like an air conditioned room or a inside a box girder, 
And the main thing to note about doing nothing is that corrosion and specifically of steel slows down over time. So your first year corrosion rate is not necessarily going to be um, your corrosion rate of 50 years because the presence of uh, a rust layer on the surface will inhibit and therefore reduce corrosion of that surface over time. So the second option is protective coatings. And in Australia, we very much focus on the first two options. So that being galvanizing and paint coatings. The other uh, techniques include um, thermal spray coating. And so in Australia, we typically don't use thermal spray coatings as much, but they are commonly used in New Zealand on, um, for example, on bridges. And so the first thing to highlight about galvanizing is that there are two main types of galvanizing that you will commonly encounter. And so this is hot dip galvanizing and continuously dipped galvanizing. I note this as I get a lot of questions about this all the time and just want to make it clear that they are not the same and they're not, they don't provide the same performance um, over a, a defined lifetime. So Hot dip galvanizing is what we're typically referring to when we talk about galvanizing in structures. So this is a technique where you dip your element into a galvanizing bath after degreasing and a pickling process. And so the thickness is achieved, that is achieved depends on the thickness of the element itself. And uh, galvanizing is typically done for ele structural elements such as um, hollow sections. Continuously dipped galvanizing by contrast is something that is carried out on thin sheet or strips. And there are two things to note about this process. So firstly, the coating thickness is typically a lot thinner than hot dip galvanizing sections. And secondly, the zinc coating thickness that you can achieve is a lot more controlled because it is less dependent on the thickness of the steel element. So typical examples of where you would see continuously dipped Galvanizing is in um, purlins, in roofs, or in met composite metal decking and sacrificial formwork. Um, and so this can be, is often used in internal environments, and a lot of people look to use it in external environments, but there needs to be some consideration, especially if looking to use for infrastructure where you might have a hundred year design life. The thickness of zinc applied typically determines the amount of protection and the length of time that your steel structure will be protected for in the specific environment. And so, so here I've uh, shared this slide just to give an indication of what I was trying to show before of the difference between hot dip galvanizing and continuously dip galvanizing in terms of the thickness. And so on this page, the galvanized sheet refers to continuously dip galvanizing and you can see the difference in thickness and therefore there will be a difference in performance over the lifetime. There are some really good resources um, on the Australian Galvanizer, Galvanizers Association's website if you want to look more into it. Your other protective coating options is a paint coating and there is a lot we need to consider when selecting the right paint coatings for your element or scenario especially when looking at the whole of life impacts. So on the screen I've uh, noted a few things to consider and so this includes uh, the environment so what will the element be exposed to including um, atmospheric exposure so um, is it in a coastal environment is it in contact with soil or with water um, or is it in an area where there's increased pollutants or chemicals for example and then we've got system life so what is the uh, lifespan that you want out of the product and or out of the coating and therefore any maintenance that you're planning for over the design life of the element. Uh, there's things like application, location and method. Um, so is it going to be applied in on shop floor or on site? Um, there's considerations around environment and safety. So there's lots of things to consider with solvents and the environmental regulations and impact and also sustainability. And so from experience, uh, when I've carried out condition assessments or failure investigations um, on many, many projects, the performance of coatings 
often comes down to a few key points. So you may choose a very high performing coating, but if the quality of the surface preparation is poor, then uh, you are likely not to achieve the required design life. And so surface preparation uh, prior to coating application is one of the most important parts of any coating specification as this determines to a large extent how well your paint coating is actually going to adhere. Um, we then have uh, poor repairs of damage during construction or service. So I've seen this a lot on projects um, and I've just finished working on a project where about 10% of bolts on the bridge have had their coating protection damaged during talking. And this now requires uh, over 2000 bolts to be repaired in situ with access difficulties. And finally, design detailing is very important. Um, so we need to consider are there areas where we might get uh, water pooling or, yeah, and horizontal surfaces where, uh, where pollutants can build up and then um, things like sharp edges. So the final point to touch on with regards to paint coatings is a difference between life to first maintenance and practical life. So life to first maintenance is when the degradation of a coating has occurred to the extent that uh, the visual coating has been completely lost or where there's been significant localized breakdown. And typically, and certainly in Australian standards, you would expect a good paint system, depending on the corrosion environment, to have between 15 to 25 years life to first maintenance. This contrasts with the practical life of the coatings. So this is where the corrosion protection is compromised to such an extent that you will need to take action to prevent deterioration of the structure or the element that it is uh, protecting. So they are not the same and they're not equivalent to each other and they are also not normally equivalent to the design life or the life of the structural element. And this is because both imply that you need some form of maintenance to continue providing protection. And so life to first maintenance doesn't mean taking off the entire coating, but starting again. At life to first maintenance, the sort of maintenance we typically see is locally reinstating areas of minor di distress um, and perhaps overall recoating of the finished coat if the appearance is important for the structure, for example. So the benefit of undertaking maintenance at the life to first maintenance and regularly throughout the element's lifetime is that it deals with the problems before they actually become significant. So as the coating degrades, it provides less protection to the structure. And as the structure grows, it becomes more difficult to successfully then actually reapply the paint coating. So if you do your maintenance regime well, you essentially extend the practical life of your paint coating. The third option for corrosion control is providing a corrosion allowance. And this can be a simple way of managing corrosion issues, which you can use if you have a good understanding of what the environment your structure will be exposed to is. So we can use a known corrosion rate for the particular environment to provide additional thickness to meet a particular design life. And there are a variety of standards which put uh, which outline corrosion rates. And so the first thing to note here is that corrosion rates are a guidance. Um, your corrosion rate for any particular part of a structure is always going to be influenced by the detailing of that structure and the microclimatic factors. For example, corrosion rate for a flat surface where water is pooling is going to be different for a surface where water is running off and allowing for the uh, pollutants to be cleaned off. So there are a number of ways to assess the corrosion rate for your project, and this can be based on um, on-site testing, such as the photo here, um, uh, calculations based on environmental data, um, which we can assess via ISO 9223, and finally qualitative uh, and somewhat subjective assessments based on descriptions, um, which is typically what AS4312 is based on. Changing your uh, alloy is something you could also consider. So commonly this will be with the use of a stainless steel or a copper or aluminium alloys. And these allo alloys all have different corrosion properties in atmosphere compared to steel. So alloy selection, as with all things in this presentation, depends on your exposure environment and the performance you need from your alloy. 
So it's important to make sure that the guidance you're looking at is really suitable to the context you're in. Another alloy that I want to touch on is weathering steels. So under appropriate environmental conditions, uh, weathering steel forms a stable patina on the surface that greatly slows down the corrosion rate when compared to uh, your standard structural steels. So this allows it to be used without further corrosion protection. And globally, around 45% of steel bridges are constructed utilizing some form of weathering steel. And in the UK, where I'm from, a large portion of our rail bridges are made out of weathering steel for the reasons of um, allowing for reduced maintenance and access requirements. However, in Australia, I am yet to come across many uh, weathering steel bridges, but I am aware of two bridges that have recently been constructed on the Princess Highway on the New South Wales South Coast, um, where they've used uh, weathering steel for the long span trough girders. And so uh, weathering steel, yeah, typically we would only use it in C3 corrosive, corrosivity categories and below. So there are some considerations required when using weathering steel. And firstly, um, yeah, it has to be in the right exposure environment that is going to allow for the stable pattern to form. Uh, and if that does not form, then you will get increased uh, corrosion rates. There, you do need to accept that there will be a change in appearance over time as the pattern forms. And um, one thing that I always note to architects is that uh, you will get some runoff, which can lead to staining. So there needs to be appropriate detailing to any elements under the weathering steel so that it does not stain those. So what is the preferred solution? As you know, there is never one size fits all and each case needs to be considered separately. Ideally, you should be looking for one option to keep maintenance and design requirements straightforward, but sometimes a combination is required depending on the scenario and environment. And so it is a key to ensure your maintenance requirements across the whole of life are also clearly laid out. Thank you, Lauren, for a great presentation. I'd now like to welcome our second speaker, Jose Fernandez. Chemical engineer by education, Jose has more than 10 years of experience in coatings. He leads Hempel's avant-garde zinc-rich product range, a proprietary technology that Hempel developed to address key challenges in corrosion protection and allow the design of coating systems that extend asset lifetime, reduce the environmental impact of corrosion and help in reducing costs associated with steel protection. Jose holds a Master of Science degree from the University of Porto and a Master's degree in International Business Management from the Autonomous University of Barcelona. Please welcome Jose Fernandez. So, uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me uh, as one of your guests. Um, today, I will present you Vantgarde, uh, a technology which has been developed by Hempel uh, technology which is taking your corrosion protection uh, to uh, a higher uh, level. Uh, the presentation today, we will start with an introduction on the technology. Uh, I will uh, present you the product range which we've developed uh, using the, the Vantgarde technology. We will focus primarily on Vantgarde 860, uh, which is 85% uh, uh, zinc based uh, epoxy uh, and we will be having some references and uh, case uh, stories as well. So starting uh, with corrosion, uh, we know well it's a natural process, uh, still degrades uh, forming uh, iron dioxide which is uh, significantly more stable in nature. It's a chemical reaction uh, an electrochemical oxidation of iron, which is present on steel. And oxygen is, is all over us. Uh, and, and this uh, degradation of steel uh, can, uh, can result in a dangerous and extremely costly problem uh, for us. Uh, buildings and bridges may, may collapse or uh, oil pipelines and chemical plants break. According to the uh, world of corrosion organization, uh, the problem 
is estimated on 1 to 5% uh, GDP on developed uh, countries. Avantgarde uh, is a technology uh, developed by Hempel, a novel technology patented, uh, protected, patented which is uh, combining uh, zinc uh, with hollow uh, glass spheres and uh, an activator. Uh, these three are working synergistically to provide what we define as a triple activation process, uh, which is uh, uh, providing three different methods of corrosion protection. Uh, methods uh, which are including um, galvanic effect, uh, inhibitor effect, and uh, a very uh, effect. Starting uh, with, with the first one, with the galvanic effect, the, the activator which we have included in the Vanguard technology is providing a, a unique activation process of the zinc we have included on the film. And it will efficiently use uh, all the zinc content, content uh, uh, present. Uh, in a traditional uh, zinc rich uh, epoxy, um, the galvanic effect is limited to uh, 20, 30 microns close to the substrate. So, with Avantcar technology, what we have is a full activation across um, uh, or throughout the, 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 film, the film thickness. Uh, we have an inhibitor effect as well uh, with Avantcar. Um, which is a, a chemical reaction. Uh, the avant guard of the film, it's able to capture uh, chloride ions, uh, uh, lowering uh, their concentration on the substrate. And around the, 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 gloss, the glass spheres, uh, we will be having this chemical reaction which will uh, form insoluble uh, products, which will stop the corrosion process. And finally, we have the rear effect. Uh, which is basically preventing oxygen of water uh, reaching uh, the substrate. Um, of course, the zinc salts which are formed uh, throughout the film will increase significantly the barrier properties of, um, of, um, of, of our product. Overall, these three methods will be providing uh, uh, superior protection and, and, of course, uh, higher durability against the traditional uh, zinc-rich uh, primers, uh, which we know. On the next slide, we see uh, uh, an illustration of uh, testing of a salt spray uh, test for 1,800 hours, where we compare avant-garde against uh, traditional zinc rich primers. And uh, in here, you may well uh, see uh, the concentration of so many white uh, salts on avant garde, and it's quite different from uh, the traditional zinc rich primers uh, where we see uh, red rust. Uh, these uh, are just a result of these uh, efficient galvanic effect, which I have explained before. and also the formation of these insoluble uh, products, uh, which are uh, a result of the inhibitor uh, effect. Uh, these white salts are uh, also additionally providing a, 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 very, a, a very effect. On the next slide, we see uh, Avantgarde, it brings um, um, a superior anti-corrosive uh, performance, but also brings um, uh, an improved uh, mechanical uh, performance. Um, Avantgarde is engineered uh, to release internal stress. Uh, we have very good mechanical uh, properties uh, overall. Um, we have a high cracking resistance uh, when we compare against uh, traditional epoxies in bridge primers. We have uh, uh, good abrasion resistance and we have outstanding adhesion on the substrate. So the three uh, properties, they really um, make avant-garde uh, from a mechanical property standpoint, uh, very, very uh, different from a traditional zinc-rich primer. 
from an application perspective, Avantgarde is a product which is quite uh, easy uh, to apply. Uh, it requires no um, additional requirement, no need for an upgrade on the application line uh, setup. Uh, it can be applied on a wide range of conditions as well, and it's fast here. Uh, overcoating intervals are quite short, so it potentially uh, the product also uh, can improve uh, the fruit put uh, on the on the on the on the shop so regarding iso 12944 uh, which is the main international standard for corrosion protection of steel by pen uh, avantgarde is a product which will fulfill uh, uh, the standard, uh, particularly uh, part six, which describes the test methods, uh, but it's a product which is uh, able to challenge part five, which, are, which is the part describing the paint uh, systems. With Avantgarde, we can achieve the performance uh, of, a, of, a, of 80 percent zinc rich primer without necessarily having uh, such a high content on zinc, so we can optimize on zinc uh, without compromising uh, the performance. We can reduce um, the system thickness, uh, the primer or the overall thickness of the system. Uh, the primer can be optimized down to 40, 40 micro. And finally, we can make these systems described uh, on part five more lean, so we can uh, uh, bring down the number of layers or the number of coats from three to two coats uh, using only uh, avant-garde combine it with, uh, with the top coat. So these are making avant-garde a true differentiator. You know, uh, leaner systems, we have gains on productivity and we have uh, reduced uh, consumption. Um, we have four uh, global uh, avant cards. Uh, these uh, four products uh, were developed uh, for uh, different levels of zinc. We have the first one, uh, which is avant card uh, 550. This product is a level three according to SSPC, 65% minimum of zinc. Um, it's a product which is performing at the same level of a traditional 80% uh, zinc. Uh, which is a level two according to SSPC. So uh, this is the opportunity that the technology uh, offer us to optimize on the zinc level without compromising uh, um, performance. Uh, we have, of course, a cost-efficient alternative here with Avantgarde 550 against uh, every uh, zinc-rich primer up to a C5 uh, very high. The next one, Avantgarde 750, so this one uh, is a level two, according to SSPC, uh, we have 80% uh, minimum uh, zinc content, the product uh, which is enabling us on challenging ISO 12944 part five, we can bring down the primary DFT to 40 microns, we can reduce the overall DFT of the system, and we can also um, reduce the number of layers so we can apply this product uh, without compromising performance up to uh, C5 high using only two coats instead of the traditional and described uh, part, part 5 uh, free layers. And the next one is Avantgarde 770. So this one will be a level 2 according to SSPC as well. Uh, this one uh, is developed uh, for increased durability. What we have seen with this product is a product which is uh, performing uh, outstanding uh, against the, the, the previous one which I have uh, presented you. So it is offering as a possibility to extend the durability. We test it uh, up to two times C5 very high or 1.5 times uh, CX. It's also an ideal uh, option for uh, a maintenance situation. Uh, it can be applied to in, in a substrate which is prepared uh, to a SA2 uh, and a, a surface which is uh, prepared or clean 
uh, using a water jetty. Uh, the next one and the one where we will uh, primarily focus our, our, our presentation today is Avantgarde 860. Avantgarde 860 is what we define as a, a true challenger and why uh, it's the highest protection and durability option which we have on the range. It is a very high level of corrosion protection and durability, uh, a performance uh, which is on par with uh, inorganic uh, zinc silicates. Uh, and this is why we classify these as a true challenger. Besides uh, up corrosion protection, from an application perspective, the product is bringing many benefits. Uh, it has been developed specifically to respond to our customer needs. And of course, it is based on the same uh, triple activated technology, which I have uh, shown you before. It's a level one according to ASSPC, so above 85% uh, Z. So Avantgarde 860, when we, have, when we test Avantgarde 860 against uh, inorganic uh, zinc silicate uh, on external testing, uh, we have a very similar performance uh, on, uh, from an anti-corrosive uh, uh, perspective. Uh, red rust is kept always below 3 millimeters. is uh, um, requirement according to ISO 12944 Part C. Um, this graph is, shows the same level between an inorganic zinc silicate and Vanguard. These are for systems uh, which are um, based on the Vanguard and these ones on the Kempel uh, inorganic zinc silicate using the same thickness of the primer and using uh, systems which are based on three layers. When we test Avantgarde 860 uh, and we reduce the microns of the system and we reduce the code, so we have a, a thickness reduction down to 63%. We have a very good performance. Uh, we are about 1.5 millimeters on rust grip with a system which is having a, FD optimize it uh, and the number of layers, uh, which demonstrates how strong the performance of Avantgarde is. This one is for a C5 very high. For some additional testing, where we have extended the duration of the testing by 50%, uh, we also see a, a strong performance, not really reaching the uh, requirement uh, described in ISO 12944, uh, we have uh, the possibility to uh, uh, consider Avantgarde as, um, as a very good uh, performing product in, uh, in, 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 in corrosion protection. Yeah. If we if we have side by side on a salt spray, Avantgarde and a zinc silicate, we see the appearance is very, very similar between these two. These pictures were taken uh, after two months uh, salt spray uh, testing, and uh, we see already some difference against uh, a traditional zinc rich epoxy where we can see some uh, red rust. If we extend the time up four times uh, C5 uh, in, in salt spray, which is about 5,700 hours of uh, salt spray, we see that red rust is quite developed uh, for a zinc rich epoxy. Uh, for the zinc silicate, we have, uh, we start to see some red rust and avant garde uh, has uh, almost uh, no uh, rust spots. So the performance is really, really uh, very strong. 
mechanical properties. I've mentioned mechanical properties uh, before. We have uh, good mechanical properties which potentially can reduce maintenance and rework uh, before the structure goes in, uh, in service. Against an inorganic uh, zinc silicate, we, we can say, we can claim we have a higher cracking resistance. Uh, you can see from uh, this slide. Uh, these stats are uh, according to NACE standard, uh, which is based on uh, thermal stress. Um, when we have uh, 160 microns, which is the double of the thickness, which is uh, uh, normally uh, uh, specified, you know, uh, although avant-garde can be specified it up to uh, 100 uh, microns. Impact resistance, another property which is quite important uh, and avant-garde, uh, it's also uh, um, performing uh, really strongly. Uh, we have a better impact resistance overall against uh, an inorganic uh, um, zinc silicate. And we trust these uh, testing is measuring the ability to resist mechanical damage uh, during the transport or during the installation. From an application perspective, Avantgarde 860 brings many benefits. Uh, of course, uh, we have uh, many challenges with the inorganic zinc silicate, who is applying, who is familiar with the application of these products, knows these challenges very well. They are not existing with Avantgarde. Um, we have a less uh, susceptible uh, product uh, to environmental required conditions, uh, humidity, temperature. This product can be applied down to minus 10. Uh, no requirements on a minimum level of humidity. Uh, this product is also having a higher uh, tolerance uh, to high thicknesses, over thicknesses. Uh, we will not be having uh, so many cracking uh, issues as we would have with uh, zinc silicate. We have no need for uh, the use of a mist coat, uh, which is an additional step. And if we do not do it when we are applying zinc silicates, we can have uh, uh, problems with popping. And we have very good uh, edge retention, high cracking resistance, which makes this product very good for critical geometries uh, on the weld seams, uh, flanges, uh, bold heads, these difficult parts uh, to be applied. From a productivity perspective, we have, of course, uh, easier application, um, which is resulting on easier probability of meeting a higher quality standard. The paint job quality will be having an impact in early failure in service and avant-garde is reducing significantly uh, the probability of improper or incorrect application because it's so much easier. And it's easier and faster uh, because we can apply free codes uh, in a system in a single shift. We have a very fast cure product uh, with very short overcoating intervals uh, without the need for a mist coat or a methyl ethyl ketone test uh, as we need for um, for a zinc silicate. So the the gains in productivity uh, when we use avant-garde against the traditional zinc primer are uh, very high. From a sustainability perspective, uh, we have run an analysis of avant-garde against uh, um, an inorganic uh, uh, zinc silicate. Um, a crowded to gate exercise, which is a partial assessment of a product uh, life cycle from extraction to factory gate, which is this table, which you see in here. And we have uh, overall on the same thicknesses, a 10% reduction on carbon footprint. If we account 
with the benefits from a sustainability perspective beyond the factory grade. And we run an exercise for a cradle to grave. We can also consider application improvement, which we have seen before. It's a faster, it's an easier application. And we also have the possibility for having a repair reduction due primarily to the advantages on the mechanical properties, which we have with Avantgarde. So we have benefits in cradle to gate and cradle to grave uh, um, assessment uh, regarding the sustainability part with, uh, with, with Avantgarde. Additionally, with Avantgarde 860, we have uh, recently um, uh, been approved uh, with, uh, with a certificate for uh, coefficient of friction. Uh, and this is an enabler for us to, to penetrate particularly uh, the bridge uh, and highway uh, segment in, in Australia with Avantgarde. 860. To summarize, um, the value drivers of uh, Avantgarde 860, uh, features and benefits, which we have seen uh, on the previous uh, slides, we have, of course, uh, fast drying, four times faster against um, an inorganic uh, zinc silicate. A free coat system based on avant-garde can be applied in a single shift. We have uh, high cracking resistance, two times better than an inorganic uh, zinc silicate. So this will mean reduced cost uh, related to rework. We have a wide application range, which goes down to minus 10. So it brings us a flexibility. We have no restriction or minimum relative humidity, uh, which is uh, a challenge with inorganic uh, 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 zinc uh, silicates, depending where we are applying uh, the product. We have no need for a mist coat, and we can obviously skip uh, the methyl ethyl, ethyl testing as well. So we improve the productivity and we have a sleep factor, factor uh, according to the Australian standard uh, to enter, uh, to enter this, this market. What we can offer to the customer with Avantgarde? Well, we can offer obviously uh, innovation. We can offer a top class asset protection. It's a level two, a level one zinc rich epoxy uh, fulfilling the sleep factor requirements. Uh, it's a faster, simpler, with reduced rework application, which will increase uh, the productivity um, and reduce uh, construction and delivery time. But it's also important to mention, will also reduce significantly the probability of something going wrong on the application, on having incorrect application because avant-garde is so much easier uh, and simpler. So we can achieve this uh, quality of the paint job uh, far uh, more uh, easier. But it will not replace the inorganic zinc silicate when high temperature is a requirement. So above 160 degrees, uh, the product will not be specified. Just to finalize my presentation, we have uh, many um, references and case studies in our website, Avantgarde website. Um, this is just two of, of these uh, case studies which we have for Avantgarde 860. This one is one which was particularly important for us where we've secured the 
project for a power plant. And uh, Avant Guard here was tested independently uh, by the owner of the power plant. And they've seen by themselves that Avant Guard was uh, performing uh, very strongly against zinc silicates. They've tested Avant Guard at 60 three times uh, the duration for a uh, C5 uh, uh, high. Uh, of course, the benefits uh, on the application side were uh, also uh, very important to secure uh, the project. We have some details on this one, including the, the floating system, uh, which has been used with Avant Guard, with the Mastic, and with the top. This information is available on the website, and I'm happy to, uh, to share. Um, the next slide, we have another one, and this one uh, was quite important. Uh, the, 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 the benefits which we have on the application side, um, the customer was really, really uh, concerned with, uh, with the downtime. Uh, for this uh, uh, factory unit in the in the Middle East, uh, and uh, and the Vanguard was uh, the one uh, the product which was able to minimize this downtime, uh, stopping uh, their fa their facility. So all the advantages which we've seen before, uh, short overcoating intervals, uh, were absolutely key. Uh, to secure uh, this project in the in the Middle East, also the complexity on applying uh, a zinc silicate in a dry uh, climate uh, made it, it uh, possible for a uh, Vanguard 860 to uh, to, to secure uh, this project. Some details as well, and the final slide. Uh, regarding some further information you can find on Avant Guard. We have uh, a website uh, dedicated uh, to Avant Guard uh, where we have an overview of the technology and how we think we are challenging uh, corrosion protection and challenging uh, corrosion standards, the benefits and the value for the customers. Uh, we have detailed explanation and description of the technology. Uh, we have some videos as well, and we have these references and case uh, stories as well. Uh, you can also further explore Avant Guard systems using our Avant Guard selector, which is on the same page. And here you can um, discover how Avant Guard technology can add value to your focus area. So if you have a focus area which is environmental impact, you can uh, uh, select the system which are uh, providing you the highest impact on, uh, on uh, environmental, uh, from an environmental perspective on carbon footprint on VOC. Uh, if your focus area is uh, time application, time productivity, you can also uh, understand which are the systems where productivity is maximized. Uh, and finally, uh, the last one, which is coping maintenance. So these are the systems based on Avant Guard, which can, can offer you the highest uh, durability uh, on, on corrosion protection. So this is all from my side. Uh, thank you very much for having me today. And uh, very happy to uh, um, hear your questions and uh, reply to, to your questions. Thank you. Okay. Okay, shall I ask you a question then? Oh, we got her back. <laughs> okay, I'll start with some questions then for you, Jose. Um, um, yeah, right, so should we just work our way through? Well, actually, Ori, I'll go with you. Um, can you please talk about some experience in underground mining solutions? Um, yes, so we do have experience using our avant-garde uh, products in mining, um, in particular in Australia. 
if the question is really about underground, um, we need to look, of course, at the at the specific application. But in general, avant-garde can be used whenever a zinc-rich primer uh, uh, is is needed uh, to pro to provide galvanic protection. So in all those situations, uh, avant-garde can substitute any any zinc-rich primer that is being used today, especially zinc-rich epoxies. Uh, this is usually C5, C4, CX environments. That's where we mostly recommend uh, system based on avant -garde. Hi, and um, just apologize for that. I might um, just, Jose, I wonder if you could just read out the, um, the next question because I'm just having a few technical issues here. Could you, you do that? Thank you. Oh, I'll do it because I'm going to ask yeah. if it'll be to Jose. So. <laughs> Um, so we've got a num there's four questions in a row for you, Jose, about your product. Um, so right. the first question is, does this paint system achieve a 10 year warranty period in a highly corrosive environment of say, um, this person wants to know specifically, um, a high rise building in a salt spray condition on the ocean front on the Gold Coast. Now, we know that your question here will be, well, yeah, I think there needs to be some clarity here as to warranty period and um, service life and that being different, but I will let you answer that there. <laughs> yes, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, customized warranties uh, can be granted uh, and we are very happy to um, um, study this case and obviously consider uh, an extended warranty uh, depending on the number of different factors. Uh, what I would ask uh, is please contact Hempel, Hempel uh, representatives and in your country, in your region, and we will obviously uh, consider um, the possibility for expanding a warranty when we have uh, avant-garde as part of the solution. Great, thanks, Jose. And um, can you just talk us through, well, actually on that, um, who are mm -hmm. the Australian license applicators to contact? Okay, Avantcard, uh, we, we have no applicator approvals um, uh, for, uh, for Avantcard. Uh, it can be applied using uh, very generic, uh, very conventional equipment um, within a very wide application conditions. Uh, so uh, we, we don't really have applicators which need to be or are as approved uh, for for applying a bank card. great and um can you just go into some details on what the required surface preparation is prior to applying the avant-garde yes we can go we can go through what i would actually suggest on this one, uh, we have uh, the detail uh, regarding a surface prep uh, on every single uh, product data sheet uh, for every single avant-garde which we have available. Uh, the one which I would probably highlight now using the opportunity is avant-garde 770, which has been uh, specifically developed for maintenance situations. So it, this is the one which is having the highest tolerance uh, to surface prep. Uh, so we can use water jetting, for instance, or we can use uh, surfaces which are prepared to a uh, degree uh, of uh, SA2, uh, and, and we can apply over these surfaces without uh, without any problem. Uh, the other avant guards are also having this information available on their uh, product data sheets, but they are not uh, as uh, recommended as avant guards for the management and for the water jetting. Of course, the information is available and can be downloaded from the website. Great, thank you. Have we got Amanda back? Mm -hmm. No, not at the moment. <laughs> All good, I will carry on. <laughs> um, so this is more of a general question um, yeah. about coatings. Um, so is there a cost benefit analysis around the cost premium of selecting more expensive materials versus standard materials and where the payback is? We, we do build um, cost benefit analysis um, uh, and purchase sales models uh, uh, with Avantgarde. 
and we build them for individual cases. Um, of course, we, we consider labor, equipment, uh, access, uh, offshore, it's a, it, it, it's, a, it's a parameter, a variable, which is uh, very important. Uh, but of course, the materials, uh, paint, thinners, everything which is used for uh, the application side, uh, they all need to be considered. So we do it on individual cases. Uh, what I would say for, for the total lifetime of the asset, uh, and I would ask again for uh, a contact uh, Hempel on, on, on this one, uh, and, and we will be very happy to assist you. Great. Um, I think I'm going to jump to, there was a question in the chat about, um, could you please talk about painting on top of galvanizing surfaces? Is this a good or bad thing to do? And I'm going to jump in mm -hmm. and answer that to start. Um, so painting on top of um, galvanizing surfaces is what we, we call them duplex coatings. So yeah, so you, you galvanize it and then you apply um, an organic coating. And duplex systems are allowed under AS2312. In theory, they should um, outperform a galvanizing system or a coating system on its own. And so they are often preferable. Um, but in practice, it comes down to, as I said earlier, with um, it always comes down to the surface preparation, but for duplex systems especially, surface preparation is key. And there are often quite a few issues with, um, basically you've got your um, galvanizers and they do all their, <laughs> they do their certain procedures. And that is a very separate process to then it getting taken to the um, shop for it to then get, uh, have the paint coating and so there needs to be special um, well certain quality controls between between that process and often uh, that is not done to the quality that sh it should be required and I've found on site a lot that um, duplex systems actually fail quicker than coatings uh, so at the moment I'm working on a project where they've failed within eight years um, and Theoretically, it should be lasting more than uh, 50, 60 years. So, yeah, and I think there is a, because of that disconnect between the um, galvanizers and the coating uh, manufacturers, that they, you can have issues with warranty as well. So there are companies that will do it, but there needs to be certain quality control procedures in place. Um, and so it is, it is a good system and it, um, it is covered under the Australian standard, but there just needs to be the right, um, yeah, quality control there. I don't know if um, Jose or Oro have anything else to say there. No, I would say I agree uh, with you, Lauren. Uh, I think it's a very critical step um, when we over apply uh, galvanized uh, surfaces. When the um, when we overcoat it. Um, and we do it properly uh, to the right level uh, of um, of the quality standard. I think we we can have some additional protection. Uh, in the end of the day, the coating will uh, will um, will um, will be an additional protection against uh, potential uh, damage. Uh, and and of course, if we damage the galvanize it uh, uh, the galvanized layer or the passivation that the galvanization is building with the environment, we will have uh, the chance on uh, encountering uh, premature uh, corrosion failure. So having a coating uh, on the top of it will, will potentially minimize uh, this uh, situation, especially on um, uh, industrial uh, atmospheric conditions uh, where a galvanization is more uh, subject to, um, uh, to um, uh, to, um, to failure. Um, one thing which I would, would you, uh, actually use, yeah. I was just going to say, Sorry. would you, um, from experience, have you seen if uh, from damaging the coating layer, the paint coating layer, has that then caused accelerated corrosion of the zinc substrate? I've seen that on projects and I don't know if that's a common thing. Um, well, it depends how 
how how how how much do you actually damage no if you would be having a, a more superficial damage on the coating i don't think it would actually have so much of an impact uh, but if the damage goes down to the um uh, through the passivation layer uh, which is created by the galvanized uh, 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 action it will it will certainly uh, and actually I think maybe I, I can use the opportunity in here no I think for against the, the hot tip galvanized uh, and the duplex system that we are now discussing we are actually studying and we are uh, instigating opportunities for having Avant Garden as an alternative to hot tip galvanizing, you no, know, because it's a, it's a far more simple application setup, uh, which brings very good results in the end of the day, uh, because we are not having a conventional zinc here. We have Avant Guard and we have seen uh, with some uh, testing uh, that we can extend the durability and depending on a number of factors, uh, but in some cases, uh, we would actually consider to recommend a vent guard uh, instead of a, of a, of a galvanized uh, uh, protection. Good to okay, know. Thank you. Um, we got you back. Yeah. We have, I am back and, and hopefully I Welcome won't repeat. Back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask a question to Oriel, just asking, can you please touch on some experience in underground mining solutions? And that's coming from Raymond. Mm, we've touched on that one already. Uh, um, have you? Go to question 12. Have, yes. Go to question yes. 12. <laughs> so thank you for that. I do appreciate it. So staying with you, Oriel, um, a question's mm -hmm. come in. Um, from Kashif asking, what is the adoption rate of Avant Garde 550 in the oil and gas sector? Mm -hmm. um, so as Jose was saying, Avant Garde 550 is a good, uh, very good alternative to the conventional 80% zinc rich primers. And, um, and uh, we have um, Avant Garde 550 systems going up to C5 very high. So, in particular, for the oil and gas sector, is being uh, is being actually adopted uh, in uh, in already some of uh, of uh, even of our customer specifications. So it's it's increased it's being increased. Um, you probably many of you in the call know that a lot of specifications required for for an eighty percent content of zinc. Uh, to for, for protection up to C5 and CX, but with Avant Garde 550, as you just showed, um, you can also meet the test requirements. And this is being adopted uh, step by step as well in the oil and gas sector, but not only. Also in the infrastructure se segment, we, we do see a lot of, um, of adoption uh, of this alternative. At the end of the day, is meeting the requirements in terms of uh, corrosion protection, right? Uh, uh, a coating system that will uh, cover the expected lifetime uh, that, uh, that you expect of protection for a given asset. And with Avant Garde 550, we have demonstrated that, that, uh, that it covers very well this requirement and this is being adopted step by step. Thank you for that. And moving over to you, Lauren, um, we've had a question that's coming from Mustafa who's asking, is it acceptable to coat elements formed of materials like stainless steel or aluminium to ensure additional corrosion prevention? Um, yeah, so generally, so stainless steel, um, I would say, uh, I'd firstly ask why do you want to coat it? Um, because, yeah, it's, it's for, I mean, specific scenarios but generally stainless steel you choose it because um, it has corrosion resistance as an alloy and therefore you shouldn't need to ha have a coating on it um, maybe an architect may want to coat it for aesthetic reasons and therefore um, you might want to then not use stainless steel um, but it'd be, yeah for stainless steel I generally say uh, probably not going to coat it because if you're going to coat coat something you're going to have to maintain it anyway maintain the coating um, for aluminium you generally will anodize it or um, 
apply a powder coating. And so that is quite typical. And you'll see that across um, facades. Yeah, most facades, if they've got mm -hmm. aluminium, will be powder coated. Um, for zinc rich um, coatings, you definitely don't want to apply those to stainless steel or aluminium. Um, the whole point of, of applying zinc to steel is to allow uh, zinc is a sacrificial layer and so that it provides um, yeah it's the galvanic effect so that the zinc will corrode preferentially to the steel and that's what provides the protection to the steel and so uh, you get different um, uh, in the galvanic scale uh, stainless steel and aluminium sit differently uh, I'm not going to go into detail there but yeah it, you you wouldn't uh, it's, it wouldn't you wouldn't use that same mechanism to protect it if that makes sense Jose and Oreo if you want to add anything to that no we are very light on what you're saying Lauren uh, there is no need especially of a zinc rich primer on on top of uh, um, aluminium alloy um, as you said for aesthetic reasons there might be some need for coating but then, of course, you need to select again the same, the, the right system to ensure vision as well. That's the case. And that will be a, a durable coding system, right? Thank you. Thank you for that. And Jose, we've had a great question come in this afternoon from Dan. And Dan is asking you, what are the implications of the avant-garde products with regard to the secular economy? Do these products make it easier or harder to recycle the protected materials at the end of their design life? Thanks, Jose. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, sustainability is right now on the agenda for Hempel. Um, we are very, very much um, um, focused on this area. And I would say it's with Avantgarde is nowhere different. Uh, from uh, a conventional coating uh, regarding circular economy. Uh, what we see as an advantage with Avantgarde is the possibility which we have to optimize the thickness, reduce consumption for having uh, a smaller impact from an environmental perspective. No? Uh, if we consume less paint by having uh, more optimized systems specified, we are uh, doing a positive contribution on environmental um, conditions, uh, on environmental um, uh, matters. Um, an additional one, I think we've uh, we touched based also the possibility on uh, using uh, avant-garde for extending the durability of the assets. Again, uh, if we protect for a longer time, it will definitely bring uh, a positive uh, impact on carbon footprint, uh, on um, on um, uh, on a cradle to grave uh, assessment. No, uh, and finally we discussed the the hot tip galvanized or some other uh, methods uh, as as metallization. When we have the chance to replace one of these methods, which are quite uh, intense from a carbon perspective avant-garde is, is bringing uh, again another advantage from a sustainability angle so overall uh, avant-garde can be a driver for, uh, for for sustainability as well and delivering on these important uh, uh, agendas which we have these days thank you thank you for that um, Jose, back to you, a question that's come in asking, do these coatings work on machined steel surfaces, meaning machined components from a maintenance perspective? Yes, they do. Uh, they do. They do work. And we have uh, developed um, uh, level two products uh, uh, with the zinc content, according, uh, which are level two according to SSPC. Uh, Avantgarde 770 has this particularity. Uh, it's specially developed for this purpose, and it's our the product that we would recommend in a, in a maintenance situation to apply on uh, on on these uh, on these machine um, on these machine the uh, surfaces. Thank you, thank you for that. 
Um, a question that's come in, uh, Aurel, to you from Rajesh asking, which is a great question um, about, uh, hi, what are the levels of fire safety Avangard 860 provides? Has it been tested? Um, any EN or other international standards? Thanks for the question, Amanda. Um, in Hempel, we also provide PFP systems, uh, passive fire protection systems, so into mess and coatings uh, to protect against fire. And uh, we do have some systems approved with Avangard products. Usually is uh, with Avangard 550, Avangard 750. These are the most common products used with, um, uh, with, uh, with our PFP uh, into mess and systems. Or usually for serologic fire protection, or also recently with um, against hydrocarbon um, fires. So we do have systems with Avangard, um, but mostly with Avangard 550, Avangard 750. Um, if uh, Avangard 860 is usually not uh, that much used in those situations uh, because of the corrosion environments those uh, those coatings are exposed to, but could be as well uh, if, if uh, tested in our labs and. Everything. Sure, because the technology is already approved for, for CPMP systems. Just to, to clarify, the fire protection, of course, is is um, brought is implemented by another coating, right? An intumescent coating, and not by Avangard itself. Thank you, thank you for that. And just staying uh, with you, RL, and maybe Jose, you may not want to comment too. Uh, Andrew sent through a question. Are any of the avant-garde products suitable for use inside water boilers? Or um, usually not the application where we would use avant-garde. Um, we have better solutions for higher temperatures. Uh, and usually um, avant-garde, as mentioned before, are coding systems uh, more to atmospheric corrosion protection uh, that really for high temperature environments. So we do have codings for those situations, but we would usually do not recommend avant-garde. If there's any reason why, as in which would be then needed in, in such a situation, then I would advise to contact our, our service teams uh, and we will, they will for sure advise on the best solution. Thank you. Um, I say a question that's come in asking you, what is the minimum coating thickness for these coatings to be effective? Thank you. Well, for avant-garde, uh, avant-garde is effective uh, applied at 40 microns. Uh, uh, and this is what we have seen. And we are specifying avant-garde at 40 microns. Although traditionally we see uh, zinc rich primers specified at 60 microns with the vanguard uh, given uh, the the technology we have we can uh, uh, we can optimize down to 40 the application range goes from 40 to 100 microns uh, but with 40 degrees we can fill the the uh, the standard uh, 129044 requirements Thank you, Jose. And Aurel, a question that's coming from Vahid asking, is Avantgarde uh, AS 2018 compliant, um, i.e. to be in contact with potable water? No, it's, it's, not, it's, not, a, uh, it's not compliant to, to AS 4020. Um, it's not recommended not, and not approved for contact in potable water. Um, going back a little bit to my uh, point before, usually we do not see the need for, for a zinc rich primer um, in this type of situations. But avant garde directly exposed to water, that should not be, this is not a proof. Of course, then as part of a coding system, uh, then it could be uh, in some systems. But again, it's not a typical use of, of avant garde. And maybe Thank just you. a clarification as well on the previous question. As Jose was saying, with avant-garde, we can reduce the, the thickness, and that, of course, uh, is due to this increased performance of this technology. Uh, keep in mind, avant-garde is always a, a part of a coding system, right? Comes at least with another layer on top of it. 
So, uh, so the overall yeah. VF, the overall thickness of the full coating system will usually be about this 40 microns. Uh, but of course, we can optimize the full coating uh, thickness as well to provide the exact um, durability that you expect. From that. And Lauren, you were looking to add to that discussion. Oh yeah, no, I was just going to um, just refer there where Oriel was saying um, it's used as part of a system. If uh, just as an example, if you were to look at um, AS twenty three twelve point one, there is a really good table which goes into um, lots of different systems that you can use, and so that would be one part of the system, and so that you're able to, if you can get hold of that standard, then take a look at that. But otherwise. Um, there are for whatever um, sector you might work in. For example, if you're working roads, then something like Transport for New South Wales, the RMS specs have details on uh, typical systems they would use. And so zinc rich uh, primers uh, would be part of that system. And so you can look there at what the other build up is. So, like a top coat, like a polyurethane top coat, which the architect may specify for the uh, architectural finish. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you for that. Um, Saron is asking you a question, Jose, asking, what is the min minimum curing period for the product? Well, the overcoating interval, which we recommend at 20 degrees, is 50 minutes. Um, 50 minutes. So within 50 minutes, you would be able to overapply a vent guard. Uh, is has just now been clarified uh, by Lauren and Uriol. Uh, Avant Guard is part of a coating system. We overcoated it with at least uh, one additional layer that could be an epoxy, uh, a polyurethane, a polyaspartic coating, depending on the final use and the final uh, requirements. Um, but Yes, within uh, 50 minutes, uh, you are able to overapply a vent guard at 20 degrees. Thank you for that. And Jose, a question that's come in from Andrew. Good afternoon to you, asking you, how does avant garde perform at 100 degrees Celsius compared, and I apologize for my pronunciation, Cerakote C-series coatings? I'm not familiar with Cerakote, but I may well clarify. Avant guard is always recommended below 160 degrees uh, Celsius. So uh, below 160 degrees Celsius, we will be able to uh, use to specify the product. Thank you. And just staying with you, Jose, for now, a question from uh, Nestor asking, the steel structures already installed on site, could Hempadure um, Avantgarde products still be applied properly to improve their corrosion resistance? Most definitely. And, and, and I think this is one of the key advantages we have with Avantgarde against zinc silicates or against a hot tip galvanizer. These systems traditionally, from an application perspective, are significantly more complex. And in site, they are difficult and hot tip galvanized it is actually impossible to do. So Avant Guard can be the solution which you do on your shop, and you can also use the same system which has been specified and applied on shop inside for small repairs before the structure goes in service according to the original spec so you um to say if it was a structure on site would you then um have to do abrasive blasting and uh surf yeah surface preparation so you need access to allow to then apply the coating correct thanks or you can use <laughs> yes, correct. Or you could use it, uh, the, the procedures for uh, uh, and treat it as a maintenance uh, situation as well. This is the flexibility with the fund card. You know? uh, we both we use it as a, as a product for a new build um, project, but we use it also for maintenance uh, situation. So it gives us this flexibility 
on the moment for repairing the structures before they go in uh, in service you know so depending on the on, on the situation if we have the chance to to um, to to grid blast the surface and and do everything according to the original spec has been uh, prescribed for the new build we can do it if we do it, it uh, following the maintenance procedure we can also use the same the same product Thanks, Jose. And Lauren, we've had a question coming from Stephen asking you, Lauren, what's the best method or methods to remediate old hot dip galvanized structures in situ to increase their longevity? Thanks, Stephen. So I think that's a good question because it leads on from what Jose was just saying there of um, using their product on site. Um, I think yeah you'd you have it's a case by case basis of understanding what um access you have um because then that will then allow you to well yeah, you then know what you can actually do in terms of surface preparation but generally you're going to have to move to a paint coating of some sort which likely uh, yeah one of those systems could be a zinc rich um prime include a zinc rich primer such as the avant garde product um I, yeah, I don't know, Jose, or if you have more on that in terms of, uh, yeah, you, it's definitely having to, um, well, it depends how degraded the structure is and uh, at what point, yeah, is there a severe corrosion? Um, <laughs> and so, but likely, yeah, it will be some type of paint coating. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I mean, I think it will be uh, very important uh, to do these uh, considerations. You know that the, the degree and the severity of the damage will be uh, will will be the, the the factor which will decide uh, the, the 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 solution which would uh, solve the problem. But generically, uh, yes. I mean, uh, hot dip galvanize it. It's always or typically uh, maintain it using coating solutions as zinc rich epoxies or uh, avant garde. Thank you. Thanks, Jose. And maybe, you know, a question for all of you and may start with Lauren is <clears throat> from Engineers Australia and particularly to our young engineers, <clears throat> what sort of trends do you see coming up in the next few years? Lauren. Mm. <laughs> um, that is a, an interesting one. Firstly, I am one of those young engineers. I'm only five years into my career having um, started in the UK five years ago um, after my degree. So I count myself as one of those young engineers. Um, in terms of trends, oh, the biggest thing is sustainability and uh, quite a few of the questions today have been around that. And a lot of the questions today have been around that and people don't realise in that we are moving more to um, maintaining, trying to prolong uh, the life of existing assets. And so that's one part of it. Um, but then, yeah, there's a lot of uh, people starting to consider uh, the carbon impact. And so I know with Jose, we had a bit of discussion around the impact of coatings and corrosion protection on the whole structure. Um, but yeah, I say the main trend that I see is around sustainability and that's coming into all bits of uh, materials advisory and consulting that I do. So maybe I might mix that question up a bit and Jose, uh, what advice would you give to our you know, young engineers, our graduates coming through? Yeah, I think for the for the future, well, uh, I think I think right now uh, sustainability is on the on the heart of everything which we do, and I think it has been one of the of the drivers also for us investing so much on uh, innovation and uh, and bring uh, solutions like avant garde uh, in, in into the marketplace, you know. Um, uh, I think we have a number of um, of um, of different opportunities where we can obviously use these uh, 
these novel technologies, uh, we need uh, we need to make sure we we create the right confidence uh, level within the market and and trust to uh, uh, to make sure that we address the these problems uh, with with more sustainable solutions, which in the end of the day are solutions like avant-garde, no, uh, innovative, uh, but uh, but at the same time uh, adding 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 uh, a positive uh, environmental impact. Thank you, Jose. And Aurel, is there anything you want to add to that? I fully agree with uh, both of uh, Lauren and, and Jose. Sustainability is, uh, is of course, a big um, and getting more and more important to make sure that um, uh, our solutions, at the end of the day, we are protecting steel, right? So we are, we are supporting the, uh, the longevity of, of a lot of the assets um, yeah, in different type of environments. And it's important that our coatings as well and the will way to even further uh, further contribute to a more sustainable um, environment. Um, and then I fully agree with Jose that a lot of it goes through technology. Um, I think it's also fair to admit that it uh, the protection uh, of steel industry in general in the different segments has been quite conservative. And this is also a bit of limitation sometimes to, to bring new technologies that deviate a little bit from the, the usual um, approach to, put, to protect the steel. And, and here, of course, standards are good reference, but we also need to make sure that we understand uh, uh, how new technologies will impact uh, the industry and that the standards uh, follow, uh, follow this trend as well and allow for these new technologies to enter the market to support the sustainability journey. Yeah, and I think just to also Building, sorry, Amanda, on the <laughs> point of technology and um, digital is I think there's uh, a bit of a crossover with the sustainability and digital of product stewardship and transparency and people wanting to understand what's actually in the products. Um, and through things like the Living Building Challenge, there's yeah lots around uh, red list materials and wanting to understand um, what isn't isn't included and then then that links to then uh, like material passports and bim and trying to be able to take the data from the start of the supply chain the whole way through so that we can actually use those materials again in the future and, and actually at different stages asset managers can go in and understand what um the product is and what data is there and then at the end of life we can do the same and um maintain the value for as long as possible Thanks, Lauren. Really. And then, and probably also the, the material, but also what is the impact of this material, right, in, in the environment. So I'm sure we will see more in the coatings wall as well, um, carbon footprints equivalent, right, more and more, maybe even in our data sheets, just to understand how products compare to each other from a sustainability point of view. Thanks very much. And, you know, what great positive messages to finish today's session with. And as always, we have um, run out of time. Um, so please join me once again in thanking Lauren Howe, Jose Fernandez and Aurel Osso for their time and input and great presentations. And thank you, Lauren, for taking over the moderator role. Um, I'd also like to thank Engineers Australia's industry partner, Hempel, for their support. Without, we wouldn't be able to do videos like this. And please, I ask you all to just take a couple of minutes to complete a short feedback form, which is linked in the description box below, helps us to improve and in plan for future sessions. Thank you again for joining us. I look forward to seeing you at our next Thought Leaders event. Thank you and good afternoon.